Hey, good afternoon to you. It is 406 here at News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we are making sense of the news. Coming up on the program, Dr. Ronnie Jackson, the congressman, is with us at 530. You can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. The left was hoping Joe Biden would have a great day yesterday. Instead, he had a normal one. And now I want to hand it over to the president of Ukraine, who has as much courage as he has determination. Ladies and gentlemen, President Putin. President Putin. I'm going to beat President Putin. President Zelensky. I'm so focused on beating Putin, we got to worry about it. Anyway, Mr. President. I'm better. About an hour later, he referred to Kamala Harris as Vice President Trump. For more on what took place yesterday and what's going to happen next, perhaps, Philip Wegman joins us now, the White House correspondent for Real Clear Politics. He was in attendance at what the White House was calling the Big Boy Press Conference. Hello, Philip. Good to talk to you again. Joe Biden is back. He is so back. He really is. It, yesterday, wasn't it kind of a Rorschach test, that, that, that press briefing? I mean, you could kind of take whatever you wanted from it. If you wanted Biden mistakes, you got those. If you wanted to convince yourself that he was a foreign policy expert, sure, you could do that too. I think you're right. And examining that press conference, it's a bit of a microcosm of the Biden presidency thus far. There were plenty of embarrassing gaffes, but also there was a defiance uh, defense of his foreign policy and domestic policy. Mm -hmm. he, with uh, President Biden, you take the good with the bad if you're a Democrat. And like you said, it's sort of a la carte. Uh, these Democrats can pick what they like and they can look past what they don't. But it's clear that the sort of, um, even with the gaffes that we saw last night, President Biden was head and shoulders over the President Biden who showed up on the debate stage. And for now, the White House is hoping that that's going to be enough to uh, calm the party and to quell the Senate. And, and he definitely appeared defiant in the face of all of the people at the top of his party who are calling for him to step down. Some of them are doing it in public. We have at least 19 Democrat lawmakers in public saying that now. You also have behind closed doors people like Nancy Pelosi and Jim Clyburn reportedly uh, begging Biden to get out of the race uh, as well. Uh, but as of now, Philip Wegman, it, he, he's not doing it. He keeps saying, I'm staying in this thing. Yeah, I, I saw uh, a meme that sort of describes where we're out, uh, where you have uh, the press asking, all right, Mr. President, are you going to step aside? And he says no. And then the donors say, all right, you need to make a decision. Are you stepping aside? And he says no. And then Democratic lawmakers say, are you going to step aside? And he says no. Look, nothing seems like it's going to change in the minds of folks who are close to President Biden. And nothing seems to have changed in his mind either. Uh, this guy is going to stick around uh, as long as he can. The, the story, the headline here, is that Joe Biden refuses to go into that good night quietly. And unless there's something more catastrophic than that debate performance, yep. uh, it seems like it's time to buckle up. And as some of these Democrats say, uh, they'll be riding with Biden. Now, there, are, there were two moments last night, though, during that press conference that I detected that Biden had created at least a small opening for the Democrats to go with someone else. First moment was when he declared that if his advisors come to him and say, you have no chance of winning this, he might drop out. Take a listen. No, unless they came back and said, there's no way you can win. Me. No one's saying that. No one's saying that, he whispers. But he did indicate that if, the, if they brought him that, if his advisors brought him that, that uh, he might be willing to go. The other thing was, he did say last night that his delegates are free to, quote, vote their conscience. They don't have to vote for him necessarily. Listen. Your convention is coming up where your delegates are pledged to make you the official nominee. If they have second thoughts, are they free to vote their conscience? Obviously, they're free to do whatever they want, but they, I get overwhelming support. Overwhelming support. I won. How, I forget how many votes I won in the primary. Overwhelming. And so tomorrow, if all of a sudden I show up at the convention, everybody says, we want somebody else, that's the democratic process. It's not going to happen. Well, actually, it's not the democratic process. But still, you have the delegates thing, and you have him saying that if they advise him, he has no chance of winning, he might get out. Did he open the door last night? 
he opened the door slightly, but there's a huge uh, door jam. If you look at the rules for the DNC, it's clear that after the first ballot, um, the delegates are, are locked in. And I think that um, I'll leave it to someone who's more of an expert on that parliamentary procedure to delve into the details. But the truth is the Biden campaign from the very beginning, uh, the president might want to say that he believes in the democratic process. They did everything humanly possible, not just to run uh, Minnesota Representative Dean Phillips out of town when he challenged Biden for the nomination, that they, they kicked him off the ballot uh, or did their best to kick him off the ballot in, in certain states. And, and this is not a sort of um, just a, a simple organic playing field. Instead, you know, the, the Biden campaign has done everything they can to you know, quell dissent and to keep back challengers. Uh, to your point, though, earlier when President Biden was talking about polling um, and if his campaign came to him and said, that Vice President Harris was a better candidate than, than him to defeat Donald Trump. Well, that's the beauty of internal polling. Uh, I don't think that the Biden campaign, even as they do uh, run some of these polling tests to see how uh, Harris would stack up against Donald Trump, I don't think there's a snowball's chance uh, in Hades that they would ever uh, confront President Biden with that polling. The infrastructure is set up such to support him and only him. Uh, regardless of, of those statements. Right. And even if they do come back with numbers that demonstrate that she is, say, two or three points better than he is uh, in their assessment, the thing that all of the Biden staffers will then say is, well, she's unproven and we haven't seen the negative advertising against her. And once that happens, she'll drop in the polls. So they'll convince him and themselves that Biden is the better guy. Yeah. And, and there was just recently the NPR Marist poll that came out in the aftermath of the debate uh, that show Biden up over Trump. Obviously, that's an outlier. And one of the reasons why a uh, average, like the real clear politics, average of polls is helpful because uh, it, it naturally accounts for the outliers. And currently, what you see in the RCP average is that uh, Trump is beating Biden by three points. Uh, he's in a precarious situation as an incumbent. And uh, right now, though, regardless of the numbers, regardless of what the uh, elite donors like George Clooney are saying, uh, Biden is not going anywhere. Um, let me ask you how about the press conference itself and how it came to be. Uh, obviously, the timing of it kept moving further and further back yesterday. Uh, so we all finally got to see it eventually. Uh, but how were the people who were called upon by Joe Biden chosen? He had a written list in front of him. Clearly, the White House had reporters that he would prefer uh, that he call upon. Um, in, in your view, how was that done? And why didn't we see questions thrown to say, you, Philip Wegman, or the New York Post, or to Fox News. Yeah, it was surprising that Peter Ducey, of all people, was not called on. And I think that uh, Peter would have been um, throwing high heat. I don't think that he would have let anything off of his fastball. Uh, a number of other reporters uh, also asked some uncomfortable questions of the president. I'm not certain how that list came about, but it's not unusual in a Republican or Democratic administration for reporters to lobby the administration to be called on during those massive press conferences. Because while we all um, you know, look forward and we, we see the president standing at that podium, if you look at the cut shot, um, he's looking at uh, you know, more than 100 reporters. So it would be a pretty wild free for all. And Biden has done this previously at his 2022 press conference that lasted much longer than an hour. Um, it, it would be a wild free for all if he just started uh, lucky dipping into the crowd. But um, if, yeah, they, and, they and that 2022, that, sorry, that 2022 yeah. press conference, if my memory serves correctly, I believe that was the same press conference that Jill Biden was reportedly angry that it stretched on for too long. And what we saw in subsequent press conferences after the uh, November midterms that year is that the first lady was seated in the front row. And that uh, shortly after she put her purse on her lap, um, President Biden ended the press conference. So I don't know if that was some sort of signal, but uh, you know, these things have their own politics. They have their own um, nature. And it, it was fascinating to see um, you know, President Biden in a make or break moment sort of yes. step to the plate. He didn't, he didn't hit a home run, but uh, he didn't strike out entirely either. But Philip Wegman, for these press conferences, uh, you know, I, I know you can't assess every reporter's inbox and how they are making their pitch to get these questions in. But one would assume that the way that they're trying to sweet talk the White House 
is to give them at least a heads up on here are the topics I'm interested in. Maybe if you call on me, I can address this. How much of that is happening, do you think? So in I've covered two White Houses at this point, and it's not unusual for reporters to say, here are the issues uh, that I'm interested in. The worst thing from a reporting perspective uh, that you can do is get called upon by a principal, and that principal will say, I don't have an answer for you. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So um, I, I'm, I'm certain that, uh, you know, some folks said, hey, I'm interested in Ukraine, and, and perhaps others um, wanted to talk about his domestic policy agenda. Yes. Um, there are all sorts of different ways that you sort of try and sweet talk the administration into calling on you. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't speculate um, as to – uh, why, who got called and who didn't. But uh, I think that some of the questions were, were pretty pointed. That's fine. Yeah, no, and there were lots of questions about, you know, uh, about his capacity and his ability to serve going forward. One of the reasons I'm obviously asking, though, is, is because the White House has been caught up uh, in its own scandal of its own creation uh, by literally writing the questions for Joe Biden for those local radio stations in both Milwaukee and Philadelphia uh, and then getting caught doing that. And so and, when and you more see than that, even... Yeah, yeah, and more than that, even asking some of these radio stations to edit the uh, transcript and audio of the interview. I think you're, I think you're right, Vince. I mean, if, if um, the White House doesn't want there to be speculation, at all, um, and certainly if the press corps doesn't want the public to speculate that they're feeding the administration questions, um, then uh, we would have to, you know, then this should not have happened, right? And I think that there was an outcry over that sort of, um, injustice on on telegraphing questions to uh, those those radio reporters, right. and all of us were you know we're aghast, right? Like these these politicians are going to look for an advantage anywhere they can get it, um, but uh, I certainly would never want to be the guy uh, who goes down in history for you know having uh, sent in questions ahead of time or yep. questions from a from a list. Yeah, and, yep. uh, and, and I wanted a pretty ugly black eye. And in fact, I wanted guys like you to have the opportunity to ask questions yesterday. And I was annoyed that I didn't see it. That was that was that was a feature of this. And I have a personal interest in this, too, because my colleague at The Daily Caller, Reagan Reese, didn't even get access to the press conference yesterday. Uh, and we were fighting for that. We wanted her in that room. They refused to let her in that room, uh, which is preposterous, given that she is at every press briefing every time it's held. And she should have been there. They should have allowed her. But they didn't. They blockaded her. Uh, and she's not alone. Other reporters also blocked from being in that press conference. Just outrageous. Yeah. But and, and Reagan's a Reagan's a serious reporter. That's a shame that the administration did that. They they should not have. No, no, not at all. Okay, Philip Wegman, thank you for all of your continued coverage of the White House from Real Clear Politics. Good to talk to you today, sir. Thank you. Yeah, hey, uh, we'll get into some of the behind closed doors chaos going on right now on the left as they navigate towards how to eject biden from the presidency you know there's just no big deal they're just staging an insurrection <laughs> on the phones though is Maisie calling in from kensington now line one Maisie, good afternoon you're on the vince colony show hello hello Maisie. i started in june of 2023 reading an 887 page document called the mandate for leadership i've heard that there's a lot of talk about it now mm-hmm uh, one of, I just wanted to tell a, a few things about it. The original, it has, you're talking, you're talking back in 1981, the original mandate for leadership. No, I'm, talk, I'm talking about the one dated uh, that is titled 2025. Oh, okay, yeah, reading, yeah, yeah. I started reading it in 2023. It took me a long time and a lot of months to absorb it. But I want to say another thing. It's not one person's idea of anything, like the press is reporting. It had. A, 360 plus contributors, experts, and yeah. there's a list of them. It had an appendix that was too large for me to even count, mm -hmm. and it had all the data referring back so you can look it up yourself. Right. The last thing I wanted to tell readers if they they want to have a, some kind of a reference is a letter that was written by George Washington in 1797, his farewell address. Yes. I, I think that everyone should read it. 
And thank you for your time and all you well, do for us. Well, Maisie, if you will, just stay with me for a second. So what you are talking about is that is the Project 2025, the current mandate for leadership, and it shares its name with the 1981 policy proposals that the Heritage Foundation and others offered up to Ronald Reagan. And he, he comes into office and he places the mandate for leadership on the desk, quite famously, of all the people who work for him. And they're able to implement all these conservative policies as he begins his administration. And so what you're talking about now is the 2025 edition of this. And we've been covering it here. It's so funny. The left is demonizing it and they're literally inventing what's in it and attacking this thing uh, because they don't have anything else to, to run on. And in reality, it's just Lots of conservatives, policy thinkers, people with, with good credentials, doing lots of research, as you point out. They've got the statistics to back them up, making proposals for an incoming presidential administration. Is that right, Maisie? Right. And I want to add that instead of just making proposals, what they're doing uh, is, is they state uh, by department all of the um, written mandates that the department itself has established. In other words, they they say what they're what they're supposed to be doing, what their vision is. This, this is not strictly conservative. Right. It's the beginning of each chapter. So they say that they say that um, you know they give information about that that you can look up on your own. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just do, yeah, and uh, you just look at it and you can get a sense of how to make the government work a little bit better, which would be nice. And of course, that for that reason, it needs to be demonized. And you're right about um, Washington's farewell address, such an important part of American history, uh, cautioning against all of the division the left is now sowing upon us, the, the dastardly partisanship that they've injected into everything, foreign entanglements. Uh, he was, he had a lot of warnings for us. Turns out George Washington was a wise man. <laughs> There's a reason we named so much stuff after him. Uh, stay with us. I want to get into this Jim Clyburn saga and where the left is taking things now with Joe. Well, hey there. Good afternoon to you. 435 here, News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up on the program, Congressman Ronnie Jackson's here at 530. You can join us, 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. We'll get back to Joe Biden's chaos in a moment, but uh, I just received an email. It's a, just a simple old press release from the Trump campaign detailing what's going on with the Republican convention uh, next week. We're beginning to get a list of some of the speakers who are going to be in attendance. And uh, this list includes the, quote, everyday American convention speakers who are going to be present. Uh, earlier this week, we found out that uh, Rachel Morin the woman who was killed by an illegal immigrant, her family is going to be represented here uh, by her brother. Her brother is going to be uh, speaking at the convention. Michael Morin, uh, is, he's described this way by the Trump campaign. Michael lost his sister, Rachel, after she was brutally murdered on a hiking trail near her home by an illegal immigrant. Rachel was a mother of five. Um, this will be you know, in terms of just getting back to the issues. The, the news cycle, of course, has been so wrapped up in Biden's cognition and lack thereof. And th that includes our show, by the way. We're, we've talked about that uh, a lot. Uh, and and I think rightfully so. It's, it's, it's a big issue and fascinating to see where things go next and uh, the future of our country very much on the line in all of this. But the critical issues that really are animating Americans are the economy and the border. And, uh, and the chaos on that border is just an utter disaster. It's just an utter disaster. And it's leading to all sorts of death and destruction, quite unfortunately. Um, and that includes the tragedy that's befallen the Morin family. And so uh, it'll be, I think, important, I'm confident, important to have their views represented. Remember during that debate, Biden was trying to answer a question about abortion and he ended up making it about illegals killing Americans, raping and killing American women. I, As a political tactic, it makes no sense that he did that, but of course... His mind doesn't function, so that's why he did it. Because it, would, it only serves to accentuate how awful his policies have been for our country and for families like the Morins. And so as the Republican convention comes back, there's going to be this temptation by the left. I can already like, see how this is going. There's a temptation by the left to stop talking about Joe's failures, 
they've kind of resented the fact that Donald Trump has essentially laid low these last few weeks. He's posted a bit to Truth Social, but for the most part, he's allowed this news cycle to continue as Joe Biden implodes and Democrats are helping him along in that way. But the Republican convention starts Monday, and as it does, the left is going to desire, the, to the extent that they can create distractions from all of this Biden chaos, to make it about Trump and whatever, Project 2025 or, you know, demon, they want to demonize something. Here's the problem they're, they're going to run into. Have you ever seen any politician produce an event like Donald Trump? Ever? These things are not poorly put together events. They are very well put together. Do you remember the widow crying as she looked up into the heavens during the State of the Union as Donald Trump called up to her and acknowledged her presence at the State of the Union? Do you remember the man who had escaped North Korea who held his crutches up in the air, put them up in the air to celebrate his ability to get out of North Korea and to make his way to the greatest country on earth, the United States of America, there up in the gallery at the State of the Union as President Trump acknowledged him? Do you remember President Trump at that same at one of those same State of the Unions delivering the Medal of Freedom in person to the terminally ill Rush Limbaugh before his death? Do you remember those events? Those events were unimpeachably great. They were the kinds of things that the left, to the extent that they had to engage them at all, they couldn't mock them. They couldn't knock them down. They couldn't treat them poorly. They just had to sit there in awe or not acknowledge them at all. And the same is true at these conventions. Each one of them has been well produced, has executed very well in presenting the overriding messages that matter to America, that speak to people on a, on a logical and in an emotional level, and get right to the core of the problems that President Trump claims he's going to come in and fix. And so when you get the Morin family up there on stage, that's going to be a big deal. And she won't be alone. There's going to be a lot of Americans. Uh, well, of course, it's her brother representing her. There's going to be a lot of Americans uh, getting up there, veterans, union members. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, uh, here is, uh, she's, we have uh, Jewish Americans who are going to represent um, the, the views, what's happening here, the support of Jewish Americans for Trump and the uh, pushing back against the vitriol and anti-Semitism of the left that we're seeing proliferating all over the place, in particular college campuses. You're going to see people who work on Trump's properties on his golf courses, they're going to come. They're going to talk about the man that they know, the business that he's built. You'll hear from school teachers. You'll hear from law enforcement officers. You're also going to hear, it turns out, I'm, I'm looking here and I'm amused by it. I love it. From the UNC frat bros who saved the American flag. That's, uh, that's one of my favorite items in this press release today as they, as they share with us some of the speakers. UNC fraternity members, it says, a group of students and fraternity brothers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill patriotically protected an American flag that had been disturbed by demonstrators during an anti-Israel protest on their campus. Disturbed may be a light touch word. They were trying to tear it away. They protected the American flag. The students gained national attention as videos of the protest showed them standing strong to protect the American flag, even as protesters antagonized them. Uh, that's fantastic. I, I love it. I love it so much. So the UNC frat boys will be there at the Republican convention. Uh, also, uh, we, we await the vice presidential pick. You've been hearing on our newscast today, President Trump uh, saying in an interview today uh, that that's coming. It's coming within the next week. A lot of speculation about who that's going to be. Is it Marco Rubio? Is it J.D. Vance? Is it Doug Burgum? Is it, uh, is, are there still conversations about Glenn Youngkin uh, go, bouncing around out there? I guess Youngkin's name keeps coming up. Youngkin, who's now openly campaigning with President Trump in Virginia, hoping to deliver that state. President Trump expected to do some rallies in the Commonwealth uh, leading up to Election Day. So it's a, it's a jump ball at this point. Tim Scott also uh, named as a possible uh, uh, pick. So we'll see. There's, there's a lot of different people who it could be. But in the end, as Ben Carson pointed out yesterday, he could run with a head of lettuce and still be able to win this thing as Trump, as President Trump. It really is it's his campaign, and he's going to ask somebody to jump in and go along on the ride with him.
Uh, Big deal, though. Big deal. It's 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 neat to it's always neat to kind of see American history as it develops, and uh, we're we're awaiting a a running mate, and we're awaiting that big Republican convention. So while the right is working on constructive things, the left, as usual, is working on destructive things, and this time the destruction is within their own party. They're trying to destroy the guy who's at the top of their own ticket right now because they're a destructive party. They're a bunch of insurrectionists, and they're in the middle of insurrecting. Jim Clyburn went on NBC today. Clyburn is considered one of the most important voices in that party. And he was being asked about all the infighting that's been going on. And the infighting, of course, has been in public. And that's really the worst thing. You're allowed to fight behind closed doors about all of this. But once your dirty laundry is airing in public, well, you've committed a cardinal sin. Here is uh, NBC's Today Show, Jim Clyburn with host Craig Melvin. Thanks, man. Thank you, Democratic Congressman. James Clyburn of South Carolina was, was one of the keys to President Biden's success in 2020, throwing his support behind the president in the Palmetto State's critical primary, which a lot of folks say put Mr. Biden on the path to the White House. And Congressman Clyburn is with us this morning for an exclusive conversation. Congressman, always good to see you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And let's let's start with this news conference last night. Again, the news conference was supposed to allay concerns that a lot of folks have, many of them within your own party, uh, about the, the president's ability to do the job. He starts by confusing his vice president with former President Trump. That was just a few hours after he confused President Putin with President Zelensky. Did he allay those concerns last night? Well, those of us who are real close watchers of Joe Biden, we do know uh, that he sometimes mangle words and phrases, uh, but uh, all of that uh, is almost natural uh, for people who grew up uh, stuttering. Oh, come on. I mean, what a pathetic defense. And remember, keep in the back of your head as you listen to all of this, that Clyburn is just lying about his position here. He's trying to force Biden out. That's the position he's taking behind closed doors. He's just grumpy that people are debating this in public because he sees the damage that's being done politically to his party. And they do focus a little more. And when you focus a little more, you tend tend to lose the flow. But you're not saying that what we've seen from this president over the last few weeks is just a function of him him stuttering. I mean, it's it's more than that. A follow-up. He's stuttering now. He is still working to overcome the stuttering of his childhood. I've been around (laughs) that condition for a long time. And I know exactly. This is so ludicrous. Have you noticed Corrine Jean-Pierre doesn't even bother to say things like this anymore? It's a stutter. How it, it operates. But he has one of the best minds that I've ever been around. And the people who've been around him will tell you that. Also, um, this, this whole thing, it's a stutter. If you talk to people who have stutters and ask them about this, or if they relay their views on this subject, it's been universal a stutter doesn't make you think of the wrong name or think that Jackie Walorski's alive when she's actually dead. A, st- that's not how, that, a stutter doesn't cause that. A stutter doesn't cause you to say that your vice president is Donald Trump. A stutter doesn't cause you to introduce Vladimir Zelensky as Vladimir Putin. That's not a stutter. That's something else. And so I would hope that we will focus on the substance of this man uh, rather than these uh, sometimes uh, misspoken words and phrases uh, and how he has run this country. But, Congressman, you've got 17 Democrats, 17 Democrats. One of them is sitting U.S. Senator who have called on 19 now. their president to step aside. No. Former Speaker Nancy Pelosi two days ago saying, quote, it's up to the president to, to decide if he's going to run. We're all encouraging him to make that decision because because time is running short. That is not a full-throated endorsement from your friend and former Speaker Nancy. Why are we playing games? Obviously, she wants him to get out. I don't, why, does, why does even Craig Melvin play a game here as if Nancy Pelosi really is saying, well, I just want him to make a decision. She said it after he made the decision. He declared, I'm staying in this thing. So quite obviously, Nancy Pelosi is encouraging him to back up from that position. Pelosi, should the conversation about the president getting out of this race, should that conversation continue? No, it shouldn't. The conversation should be over. No, the conversation should focus on the record of this administration, on the alternative to his election, and let Joe Biden continue 
uh, to make his own decisions about his future. He already did. He already decided. He's earned that right. And I am going to give him that much respect. No, he is not. Now, here's the thing. Clyburn, it is being reported today, is among what the press is describing as the Avengers. These are these, these ridiculous people are uh, Democrats, the top Democrats in the party, who are coming together to meet with Joe Biden or whoever they can get to as Biden's circle becomes more and more closed off, as this entire process becomes more and more Soviet, to try and force him out. The Daily Beast today, the, pl- the latest plan to try and force President Joe Biden to drop out of the presidential race would see a group of heavyweight, quote, super friends from the top of the Democratic Party head to the White House together to speak with a united voice and tell him that his time is up. The super friends are assembling, a House Democrat told Politico. There's a group of people who are going to go make their case to whomever they can get to at the White House that he needs to step aside and we're going to get our asses kicked if he doesn't. The plan would see a group of Biden's oldest and most senior Democratic colleagues come together to make a definitive statement on behalf of the party that it would be damaging if the president were to continue. It is hoped that team would include Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, President Pro Temp Patty Murray, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and Representative Jim Clyburn. All working to eject Joe. The alleged showdown would end the perception that Democratic leaders are divided about whether Biden, 81, can serve as president for another four years. So that's what they're doing. So I'll pause and point out uh, there's a, a discrepancy here. They, the headline on this piece is Avengers Assemble, and then they describe all of these people as the, quote, super friends. Um, you're mixing up your comic book universes. That's not appropriate. The Avengers are Marvel. The Super Friends are DC. Please keep them separate. The left is once again ruining everything. I got to say, there's so many hilarious people on the right. There's so many hilarious. You know this Project 2025 thing? So, so the left is trying to demonize Project 2025. Meanwhile, the right, they're just tweeting up a storm about all of the things they, they really want to bring back in 2025. Uh, you want some examples? Uh, the five dollar foot long. I want that back. You know, back, remember back before inflation, the five dollar foot long. That'd be fun. Also, the uh, they want the original Pizza Huts to come back. The uh, the awesome experience of dining indoors at a Pizza Hut. You know, with the big red roofs and the red cups. Bring those back. There's a lot of guys. They want to bring kind of that '80s '90s vibe. I think is is what people are looking for. A blockbuster video reopening nationwide. That would be that's a that's a return to greatness. Make America great again. Get blockbusters back. That was before these uh, these streaming companies could memory hole your favorite movie as soon as they found out it was offensive or put trigger warnings ahead of Bambi or whatever it is that they're doing now. It's crazy. Uh, what else? What else is there? <laughs> A middle car seat with no seat belts. Uh, cocaine and Coca-Cola. <laughs> bring, bring back cocaine and Coke. A 1975 Trans Am for every American. Pull tab beer cans. McRib all year round. There's a lot of food on this list. Yeah, so uh, they just... Oh, no fat chicks in the Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Edition. <laughs> that would be great, wouldn't it? That's pretty funny. Uh, this is this is this is a wonderful idea, by the way. Just your favorite things about the way America used to be, and just call it Project Twenty Twenty Five. Is <laughs> just restore America's greatness uh, all over the place. Yeah, that'd be that'd be good. Uh, yeah, uh, Democrats are all uh, working hard to to get rid of Joe. I was just playing that audio of uh, Jim Clyburn. Uh, clearly, is trying to get rid of him. Nancy Pelosi trying to get rid of him. Chuck Schumer trying to get rid of him. Obama trying to get rid of him, and he's holding on. Isn't it the best? Isn't it just the best that he's holding on for dear life right now? I, I, can't, I can't enjoy this entire news cycle enough. I just think it's wonderful uh, that he's doing it. Uh, last night during the debate, as uh, he was messing up, not the debate, excuse me, the press conference. Here I am messing up. During that press conference last night, as he was messing up, uh, Trump was dunking on him last night during, on Truth Social Speaking of guys who are having a great time, he wrote, Crooked Joe begins his big boy press conference with, 
quote, I wouldn't have picked Vice President Trump to be vice president, though I think she was not qualified to be president. Great job, Joe, Trump posted. And then he started posting videos throughout the, the press conference in which Biden could be seen struggling to finish his statements as he stuttered through them. <laughs> just, just truth socialing his way through the whole thing. And Democrats, their reaction to all of this last night, according to Jackie Heinrich over at Fox, she spoke to a Democrat source who said that this is the worst possible outcome they could hope for. Because what if you're a Democrat, what did you really want last night? You either wanted Biden to hit it out of the park, to show up, to, to be like Willy Wonka walking out of the factory, do a somersault, jump up onto your feet, and everybody applauds. He's in perfect shape. Or you want him to fall flat on his face and provide a basis to kick him out of the election last night. Neither of those things happened. Worst possible outcome, said the Democrat strategist, unless you're Hunter and you need a pardon. <laughs> Jackie responds, because it prolongs him stepping down? Democrat strategist, yep. Yep. Misery on the left. Finally. Finally, some misery on the left. Coming up, Congressman Ronnie Jackson, former White House physician, is going to join us in the next hour, and we'll take your calls as well, 888-630-9625. Stay with us.